I think what we're seeing now is a real acceleration of disclosure. Who David Grush is in terms of his position within the intelligence community is absolutely key to why this story is so important. If you're looking at his professional credentials, his authority within the intelligence community, and the correctness of the protocols by which he's moved forward, David Grush is beyond reproach. And that is what makes this story so interesting. There's quite a background to what's happening in Washington in 2023. Anyone following the topic noticed this shift at the beginning of the 21st century. And from that time to this, there has been an acceleration of declassification. And so there have been files released by governments all around the world that mean that all of a sudden there is far more credible data available to the public about the UFO phenomenon than there has been in decades. Early in the 21st century, we saw the beginning of a movement for disclosure staffed by people who previously had been employed by government and military units devoted to analyzing UFO sightings. That's interesting in itself. The fact that people who had signed layers and layers of non-disclosure agreements and bound by layers of official secrets laws were allowed to campaign for declassification of government UFO files was interesting. Why would they have the clearance to turn around and say all this should be made public when their job had been to look at these things in deep secret? During that period, we had a figure like Paul Hellyer, the former Minister of Defence for Canada, claiming that in military intelligence and covert government, it was known while he was in office that we were in contact, that we were being visited by extraterrestrial craft. And he was allowed to say that. There were no consequences for him saying that. There was no official debunking of him. He was allowed to make those statements, and that was something new. And then in 2008, Dmitry Medvedev, who at the time was the Prime Minister for Russia, on a live microphone, said that each successive Prime Minister of Russia is given a dossier detailing the spacefaring civilizations with whom we are already in contact. And again, there was no debunking. Uh, President Putin didn't go on camera and say, I have to distance myself from my prime minister's remarks, or those are his private opinions. It was no kind of statement like that. It was just left hanging for people to notice. In that same period, we had the fascinating case of Gary McKinnon. Gary McKinnon, working on his own, had managed to hack NASA computers and evince data with images and text suggesting there was some kind of collaboration already going on between US military intelligence and an extraterrestrial faction. The USA wanted to extradite Gary McKinnon and put him in prison for the rest of his life. And Parliament in Westminster in Great Britain said, no, that's not going to happen. And in fact, an amendment was passed to change the law altering Britain's relationship with the United States of America in terms of extraditions in order to protect Gary McKinnon. And so we had the spectacle of Parliament in Westminster discussing Gary McKinnon and his fines, although they never really probed into the implications of these evidences towards collaboration. But there it was in the public domain for all to see. But the real acceleration came in 2017, when the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush, Chris Mellon, released the footage of the encounter between the USS Nimitz and its aircraft and tic tac shaped craft. And that footage has now been viewed by people all around the world. We've seen those craft, we've seen how they move, and we understand what the unit's chief, David Fravor, means when he talks about the technological capabilities of those craft being well beyond anything terrestrial technology can explain. We now know that Chris Mellon had a clearance 
to release that. There were no repercussions upon him for doing that. And it was a kind of testing of the waters to test the public response. There was no blind panic. And so after a two years testing period, the Pentagon steps forward, comes clean and says, yes, we authenticate that footage. That encounter really did happen. And in fact, we have had a unit investigating these encounters and examining physical materials retrieved from UAP crashes for more than 70 years. And we heard from Lou Elizondo, who had headed up that unit for 10 years. It was such a vault fast from decades long policies of silence, no comment or debunking to saying, well, actually, yes, there are UFOs and yes, some have crashed and yes, we have materials and yes, we've been examining them for 70 years plus. Some people listened to Lou Elizondo and said, I just don't know what to make of this because Here's someone who was employed by the government. Is this just a government story that we're hearing? And with what agenda? Is it true that we have physical materials from UFO crashes? Because that's earth shattering if that's the case. Well, it wasn't just left to Lou Elizondo to say it was so, because we then heard from the former chief of French intelligence, Alain Juillet who said publicly that he was there at the launch of the current iteration of that unit and that yes, indeed, it existed to examine metamaterials from UFO crashes. We then heard from the very eminent physicist Jacques Vallée, who said, yes, he's one of the scientists involved in examining those metamaterials. And we heard from the American physicist, Eric W. Davis, whose job is to examine those materials and then brief the Pentagon's unit on the implications of what has been found. So all that was in the public domain before David Grush stepped forward. Eric Davis had spoken publicly about the fact that we were examining materials from off-world vehicles not made on this earth, which can't get more explicit. We're talking about UFOs, we're talking about ET technology. But what David Grush has added to the story is we're not just talking about bits and pieces of metamaterials, we're talking about entire craft and we're talking about pilots. So again, we're into the territory of contact, conversation and possible collaboration. Then in 2020, Haim Ashed, the Brigadier General, who for 28 years was Israel's Chief of Space Security. So it was his job to know if we were in contact. He stepped forward and said that on the basis of his privileged information, his understanding is that we have been in contact at a covert government level for more than 70 years and that we have been involved in technology sharing and collaborations and research projects here and on the surface of Mars. So this was a very far reaching statement, which we might have just shrugged off were it not for who it was saying this, there could hardly be somebody more credible than Brigadier General Hem Ashed. If what he is saying is true, that supports the claims of David Grush in Washington. People have said to me, well, I don't know if I trust David Grush because he was employed by the government. And if he was employed by the government, then he's probably a shill pushing forward some official misinformation. But I think that would be a mistake because what's happening now is embarrassing to Congress, to the Pentagon, to the intelligence community. I can't see that there's any real benefit to the powers that be of this current impasse between the Pentagon and Congress. I don't think it's logical to say that because someone has worked for the government, they must be a shill. I think to dismiss David Grush as a shill is a mistake. He is actually taking a great risk in being the front man for this constitutional challenge. He has already faced reprisals. The scepter 
published this article about his medical history, the fact that he'd suffered from PTSD, the fact that he'd self-medicated for it, as if that was at all relevant to what was going on, because it is about the legality of one arm of government being denied information by another arm of government. It's got nothing to do with David Grush's PTSD. But the fact that he's had that pushback, I think, shows you he's not doing this for his own benefit. He's being incredibly courageous. And before he made this official complaint, which the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community found to be credible and urgent, he had sat down with the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community and asked for a clearance to do an interview with the Australian journalist Ross Coulthard to bring all this to public attention. When somebody who has been employed by the government, bound by layers of official secrets laws, when somebody like that steps forward and starts speaking, instead of saying, oh, they're a shill, I think you should listen very carefully to what they're saying because there will be so much that they are not allowed to say that what they do say becomes even more significant. So every time in that hearing on July the 26th that David Grush said, I can't answer that publicly, that would have to be in a closed session, I can answer that in a skiff, you have to realize that the question that preceded that statement is being validated. He is saying there is something to see here, which is under wraps. And it's the under wraps aspect of it that is so interesting. Members of Congress want to know, are we in contact? Is there technology sharing? Are there communications going on? Is there collaboration going on? And what exactly? does David Grush mean by non-human biologics? He's not talking about moss on a damp portion of Mars or a bit of ice on a cold corner of the moon. He's talking about pilots. Are they alive? Are we in conversation? Are we in collaboration? That's what members of Congress would like to know. And that's what I think a growing number of the public is also wanting to know. By what right is information like that withheld from the public and in whose interests? After more than 70 years of research, these units within the intelligence community must have some idea it's high time that you and I are brought into the picture. People who follow the topic might not be surprised as this picture opens up, but also anyone who listens to the indigenous and ancestral narratives of people groups all around the world, they'll realize that these claims are only telling us what our ancestors told us. The Bible tells us that there was covert contact. The Mayan tradition tells us that ancient rulers had contact while the mainstream society did not. So it's an old picture that's simply being reasserted. The Bible does make reference to ancient technology, craft that are described. We have the word kavod, conventionally translated as glory, and the word ruach, conventionally translated as spirit. But you look at how those words operate in the texts, and you'll realize that a kavod can be in the sky or on the ground can be to the left or to the right, it can be moving across the landscape, that it can launch and land vertically, SpaceX style, and that it will shake the ground as it lands and launches, and that you can't be out in the open when it launches and lands. So you've got this kind of technology that's portrayed from the outside. Moses describes it from the outside, the, the cloudy pillar, as it's called. And then you've got Ezekiel telling us what it looks like from the inside, the metal textures, the transparent canopy, the sound of the engines when they fire up, the vibrating feeling when the engines start, how the rotors respond to voice commands, wheels described in such detail that NASA has a patent on them. So no, it's not the Spirit of God, it's a craft. It's sometimes called the Ruach because it creates a blast of air. And that's what the word ruach means. So you've got technology like that referenced. You also have 
wormhole and portal phenomena referenced in biblical texts, and also, as I show in the Eden Conspiracy, referenced in archaeological finds. When I published my first book of Paleo Contact, Escaping from Eden, I started to be contacted by veterans of war, and in particular, veterans of the war in Iraq, the 2003 incursion into Iraq. And the questions they came to me were often, what's the credibility of portal technology, Stargate technology? And they were asking me because they had gone into that war thinking they were there for one set of reasons, the public reasons for regime change to rescue the world from weapons of mass destruction. And then they get there and they find their particular unit is on an archaeological mission. When they get back, they start sounding out their comrades and they found that some of them were on missions that were to do with ancient technology, Stargate technology. And so they asked me, what's the credibility of that? Do you have any privileged information? And my answer has been, I don't have privileged information. I haven't had eyes on. Some of your colleagues may have, because if I follow the text of the Bible in parallel with the source narratives from ancient Sumeria, they say that if you're looking for Stargate technology, you will look in the country that today we call Iraq. And they report that it was operative thousands of years ago. Now, if any world power supposed for one moment that there was ancient and maybe possibly functional Stargate technology on the planet, they would want to have it. They wouldn't want anyone else getting it. And so you will go into the country and you will create a world heritage order around that place. You will give it a military guard. You'll stop anyone else excavating there. And that really is the story of the recent past, as we, our forces, have looked for ancient technology. And so my very strong suspicion is not only have we looked, but we have found. And once found, of course, you would want to know how does this work? Can we use these? Can we reverse engineer these? If you've been examining it for 70 years, of course, you'll be addressing those questions. We do have references in the book of Ezekiel, in the Hebrew Scriptures, and the book of Revelation in the New Testament, where the writers have either physically seen or they've remote viewed a craft that is designed to carry thousands of human beings. In their own language, they describe artificial light, the lights of technology, the textures of a craft, hydroponic farms with inside the craft itself. So in Revelation, it's described as a city, except we're told it's a cube that can carry tens of thousands of human beings. And in Ezekiel, it's described as a temple, a giant building, the way the Vedas talk about flying buildings but it's simply the ancient frame of reference for describing huge craft that are designed for a breakaway civilization or to carry people like us here. Either way, we've got the story of locomotion to and from planet Earth. If we've got materials retrieved from small craft, it's entirely possible that we have far larger craft that have landed here and remained here. And there are some very large, should we say, pixelated areas of planet Earth where that is entirely possible. Now, if any world power supposed that there was ancient functional technology on the planet, they would want to have it. It was clearly very far forward in the mix of reasons to go in because within days, of establishing the Allied presence in Iraq, the archaeological team was there excavating the Gilgamesh site. And I remember Jörg Fassbinder briefing the BBC about this exciting mission that through soil magnetization, they had identified a site that correlated with all the details given in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And the amazing thing about that is twofold. First of all, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest written narrative in the world that is known. And it tells the story of Gilgamesh, a crossover king 
between the ET kings, the sky people or Anunnaki who govern our ancestors in the deep past, and then the human lineages of kings and queens and rulers who came after. Gilgamesh was a crossover and he was a hybrid. So the opportunity of this find was to fact test the world's most ancient story. Was it fiction? Was this story that talked about ET rulers and then human leaders following fiction? Or did it happen? And the find in Iraq meant we could test that. It was the find of the age. And yet, we get there and it all goes silent. A few years later, Jörg Fassbinder is speaking to a French journal, and his explanation is, we decided not to explore any further. We decided to bury the site for its protection. Well, is that logical? That it was so important that within days of going into Iraq, we're there to dig it up and then we change our minds? Isn't it more likely that we didn't want to do the tests in public? We wanted to know what the result was before deciding what to do next. And I would suggest if the result had been, oh, there's nothing to see here, it's just human, very old human remains, they would have published that. It's only if they'd found something further reaching that it would go quiet. So follow the story. You can Google it for yourself and follow the logic. Something was found. And it must have verified the ancient stories. Otherwise, we would have been told. The Bible in the book of Job references three regions of space from which visitors came, Orion, Sirius, and the Pleiades. It talks about this body, the El Ba'adat, the Council of Powers, or what we might call the Sky Council. And then it references these conflicting agendas, an agenda for exploitation, an agenda for mining, and then an agenda for nurture and assistance. So it says from the beginning, there have been multiple demographics interested in Project Earth, and they have conflicted with each other as to how the project should be managed. And I believe they tell us that, not only so that we would know how things were in the past, but so that we would understand why things are the way they are today. Our ancestors believed we would never have a full understanding of what's happening on Earth until we recognize there is a non-human layer to the story of our planet and our species. When I first came to this understanding through my research path for escaping from Eden, I'd never heard of Marobellino, but I was delighted as I came towards the end of producing that book to learn that I wasn't the only person arguing for these translations from the biblical texts. There was this Italian scholar as well, an Italian Bible scholar, and not just any old Italian Bible scholar. Mauro's work was with the Edizioni San Paolo, producing the interlinear translations for Vatican-approved Bibles. Now, that's a very exacting discipline because giving the interlinear meaning means you have to give the root meaning of each word without imposing interpretations. He was becoming very clear that the story told by the interlinear translation was different to the traditional translations. He began to realize what I realized. It's a story of paleo contact. He worked for the Edizione San Paolo for a long time, and he argued that some of these words should be left untranslated so that the reader could see for themselves how the Yahweh character behaves, what role El Elyon takes, how does a Kavod behave, how does a Ruach behave, how does a Kali Mapasau function. If you leave the words untranslated, it becomes blindingly obvious you've got a story of paleo contact and ancient technology. So I was thrilled to discover him. And at one point I thought, oh, should I stop and read everything Mauro's written before I finish my book? And I thought, no, I won't do that because it's far more interesting for the reader if I apply my logic to my data using my skills from my background and reach similar conclusions to other scholars like Mauro 
then it's more interesting for the reader because when they see the overlap, they'll think, oh, my goodness, there really is something here. But in The Eden Conspiracy, we actually get together. We've produced a series together, which you can watch on the Fifth Kind TV, where we drill down into some of the words the Bible has associated with God, and we argue that the root meanings show us something completely different. And in The Eden Conspiracy, I make reference to this series, I go to these words, I show how they operate, and again, make the point of if you're not convinced by my root meanings translations, leave them untranslated and let the drama of the texts themselves tell you what is going on. And that was a lesson I learned from Mara. When we read the texts that came out of the Nag Hammadi find, we are reminded that in the beginning, Christianity was a great kaleidoscope of texts and experiences and theologies and ideas, and that it was a far more interesting picture that emerged from them. Just as there was a paring down of Judaism into a simple, clean monotheism, the same thing happened with Christianity. In the beginning, there were all these ideas, experiences, and documents, and then after three and a bit centuries, it had been pared down to an official canon. And so everything that falls outside the canon tends to get called Gnostic these days. And it's not that they all say exactly the same thing. They are just the other, the non-canonical texts. But even if you go to the canonical texts, it's rather telling Jesus never mentions Yahweh by name. He doesn't teach in his name. And in a number of moments, he actually seems quite opposed to Yahwistic law. And early on in the church's story, in the book of Acts, the apostolic leaders realize Christianity is not built on Yahwistic law. Jesus has canceled it. Many times he said, you've heard it said, but I say this. Moses said this, but I say this. The law said this, but I say this. He's putting Yahwistic law to one side and bringing something quite new. He talks to the Jewish leaders and he says, your father was a liar. Your father was a murderer. Your father was a devil. Well, who's he talking about? And why does he never pray to Yahweh? In the canonical gospels, Jesus, when he prays, he uses the word Abba, which means father. When the gospel writers write, they use the Greek words kurios for Lord and theos. And theos means the God and source of the cosmos. The Apostle Paul defines the idea in Acts 17 when he says, by God, I mean the source of the cosmos and everything in it, that in which we all live and move and have our being, of whom we are all offspring. And that's very different from the vision of Yahweh in the Hebrew scriptures, in which Yahweh is an entity in competition with other entities. And so there's quite a break from one tradition to the other. Jesus was emphatically not a Yahwist. And even on the one occasion when he's in a synagogue reading from a Yahweh's text, the gospel writers cannot bring themselves even to write the name Yahweh. They say, Numa Kurios, the spirit of Kurios, the spirit of the Lord. And so, yes, there's a break. You go into the non-canonical gospels and, yes, a more interesting picture emerges. And you've got international thought washing through those texts, the idea that we are conscious beings who then have a material experience and then go on to another experience, that is in those Gospels. The idea that our region of space was modified by beings that were not God, that our planet was terraformed by a being who was not God, it's in those texts that you'll find it. And it wasn't just the Gospels that were found at the Nag Hammadi, Copies of the Book of Enoch were found there as well, which had not become part of the mainstream Hebrew canon because it's so overt in its description of contact with non-human entities. So in the Eden Conspiracy, again, I say, go back and look at what Christianity was in the beginning. Listen to what church fathers like Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Marcion were saying, and you'll realize that what I am saying is really primitive Christianity. Christianity that wasn't afraid to acknowledge a populated universe and that wasn't afraid to acknowledge 
Paleo Contact in the Bible. I totally understand people being nervous of religion, which is why I love the Sumerian texts so much. The Sumerian, Babylonian, Arcadian, Assyrian texts, they are not sacred texts in any religion. So go there, read those, and work out what they're teaching. They talk about the Sky Council. They, they talk about contact that's been there for thousands of years. Anyone familiar with those texts would be unsurprised by what Hayem Ashed said just before Christmas 2020. He was the Brigadier General who for 28 years was the Chief of Israel's Space Security Program. So it's his job to know if we were in contact. And he says, yes, we are. Yes, there's this Galactic Federation. You hear that, you think, oh, I know that because it's in the Sumerian texts. But I would also say, well, if you're nervous of religion, so am I. But the Bible isn't about religion for the most part. The Bible is about paleo contact. And once you read it through that lens, you realize it's teaching you about covert government and covert contact. Anyone who reads the ancient texts of the Hebrew scriptures, again, will be unsurprised that there is a galactic federation because the Bible calls it the El Ba'adat, the Council of Powers. It's the Sky Council. It's the Tseva Hashemayim, the Sky Armies. Whether you go to the Bible, African story, the Vedas, Norse story, our ancestors have always said there is a non-human layer to the governance of our planet. Back in the 1600s, Robert Kirk, a Presbyterian minister in Aberfoyle in Scotland, wrote a book which he had produced simply by listening to Celtic story, listening to the lived experience of the locals. And he joined the dots and he argued that if you want to understand why things work the way they do on planet Earth, you have to understand, first of all, there are elites that operate above national governments and they are in contact with a non-human presence. That's exactly the same thing that Hayim Ashed said. That's what the Bible is about. It isn't about religion. It's not there to teach religion once you see the big picture. Once you read the story of that reform from King Hezekiah through to the senior priest Ezra, you realize the authors have guaranteed that we never forget paleo contact by telling us how that story was suppressed and changed. So it's an explanation of the world today, why things work the way they do, why there are still conflicts over how many human beings there should be on the planet, how long we should live, what access to medicine, what access to clean, safe drinking water, which is going to be a huge issue in the 21st century. Our ancestors wrote this to equip us for the present and to engage intelligently with geopolitics today. I think we can't have an intelligent geopolitics until we realize exopolitics is involved. My hope for the future is not in the candidates who we're allowed to vote for from one general election to the next, but in terms of our allies on the Intergalactic Federation, our allies on the Council of Powers. If we didn't have allies in higher places, then we would have been exploited to the point of non-existence. And once we join the dots and realize there are some presences here supporting the human experience, then we're in a position to engage more intelligently with what's really going on. And I, I want to emphasize that because I think at the moment what's in the news is framing all contact as terrifying, negative, invasion of the body snatchers, Mars attacks, and that is not the whole picture. It's an aspect of it, without a doubt. We have faced exploitation, we've faced hostility, but that's just at one end of the spectrum. And we have helpers at the other, and we have a council of powers. I'm interested in us as a species engaging more intelligently with that, knowing who our friends are, knowing who we should work with for the betterment of the human experience. If you just follow Sumerian story and join the dots to the recent story of Iraq, I think you arrive at a yes in terms of ancient technology. 
I think if you follow the white rabbit to Antarctica and wonder what's being protected there, I think you'll get to ancient technology. And to those in the programs, I would say our ancestors trusted the people with the knowledge that we're in a populated cosmos. How can our ancestors have been better able to cope with that information than people today? Recent polling suggests that 70% of of Americans would be totally unsurprised if they were told, actually, we're in contact. So there's not going to be the blind panic that we've assumed in the past there would be. All these bodies are communities of people, just as the government is a community of people, the Pentagon is a community of people. So there's always a spectrum of views within any group. There'll be some wanting more disclosure, some wanting less, some more confident of the public response, some less. So there's always this push and pull in the process of disclosure. So this is disclosed, then there's a pulling back. This is disclosed, then there's a pulling back. And it represents, I think, a bit of a to and a fro in the conversation. But I would say, look, with that polling of 70%, with our Greek cousins unafraid of these ancient stories, with indigenous cultures unafraid of these stories. They're not living in blind panic, and I think neither would the majority. I actually think the approach of soft disclosure that's been going on is wise. Drip, drip, drip the information until people are not shocked, people are unsurprised. But I would really want to urge the journalists to keep this in the news cycle, to keep the pressure up, to say we do want to know what's going on. And no, there's not going to be a blind panic. And I think if we continue down this path of gradual disclosure, the powers don't have to be afraid of the enormous political fallout that they're obviously fearing. They don't want a percussive moment where the American president steps forward and says, my fellow Americans, I've got something I want to tell you. And then say, we've been keeping secrets for 70 years. No, let it out gently. That's fine. But let it out. Because I think Homo sapiens are intelligent enough to cope with living in a populated universe. And I think knowledge is power. The more we know of what's going on, the better we are to engage with it intelligently. Many churchgoers would be very shocked. And one of the reasons I'm motivated to produce my books is to bring people of faith into the conversation. I get people every single day from the Christian world attacking me for what I'm writing. And from time to time, I'll say, go and ask your pastor if what I'm saying makes sense of what is in the texts. Because a lot of Christians would be shocked if they went to their pastor and say, Do you believe that our God's stories are based on Sumerian stories of ETs? Well, if they've got a degree in theology, they'll have to say, "Mm, I was somewhat aware of that, yes. Go to your seminary where your pastors come from and ask them if they are aware of the Sumerian narratives being about ETs and the Bible being based on that. Get to the seminary. It's something we don't talk about, but go to the higher-ups in the denomination. Yes, this is what frustrates me. Since the 1800s, academic authorities have known about the ET narratives on which the Bible is based, but it hasn't filtered down into the preaching in churches. And so I, in a way, I'm challenging pastors and senior church authorities with the Eden Conspiracy to say, come clean, own up to what you learned in your degree. Own up to what was discovered in the 1800s when we translated the cuneiforms for the first time. And if you're a pastor who knows there are ETs in the Bible, let your people see it. If there's a text like Genesis 6, where it's blindingly obvious there are ETs washing about in it, don't gloss over it. Don't cover it up. If people have questions, encourage the questions. If there's an openness to the text and it can mean different things, let it be open. Trust the intelligence of your people because you can bet your bottom dollar half your congregation have worked this out but don't know there's permission to talk about it. 2009, the Roman Catholic Church, under the most conservative pope in my lifetime, gave permission to believers all around the world to go back to the Bible and find ETs in it. 
And they did that through the colloquium of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. They did it through sending senior spokespeople out, like Monsignor Corrado Balducci, the Vatican senior advisor in paranormal ministry, Father Jose Gabriel Funes, the director of the Vatican Observatory, Reverend Dr. Guy Consolmagno, senior astronomer for the Vatican Observatory. They are senior spokespeople for the Curia. They met the press. They did TV interviews where they said, yes, we should expect ET contact. No, we should not be surprised. We should be ready to embrace them as a brother or sister alien. We shouldn't be surprised because they're there in the Bible. Now, look, if the Roman Catholic Church can do that under a pope as conservative as Pope Benedict XVI, it's high time that the rest of the churches give permission to their people to ask these questions, to see what's in the text, and then have an open conversation about it. I know that there are what you might call mega pastors in the States who know everything I have told you today, but haven't preached a single sermon on it yet, because they are frightened of their people's reaction. But again, I say you can go softly, softly. You can read a text and say, now, what in the world is going on there? And don't answer the question. Trust your people's intelligence to join the dots, to put the puzzle pieces together. If you're a pastor, your job is to pastor people through the reframing that results from seeing what's in front of them. Many people in your churches will have had close encounter experiences. If they can't talk to you about it, who are they going to talk to? And if you can't pastor them through that, well... Christians around the world are far more ready to deal with this than we give them credit for. Believers can do business with what is going on, can engage with what's in the news right now, and begin to open up to a far more interesting cosmos. I just want to take a moment in this video to say a big thank you to all my followers for this. I've reached 100,000 subscribers on the Paul Wallace channel. So it's a red letter day. I'm going to open it live on camera here. It was just delivered by our postie. And I'm looking forward to seeing it in the flesh. And after several attempts, we are there. (laughs) One beautiful, long awaited silver play button. Well, I'm so pleased to have this. I want to say thank you for all your support that's got the Paul Wallace channel to this point. On The Fifth Kind, we're already up to 951,000 subscribers, but this is a red letter day for my humble Paul Wallace channel. Thank you for everyone who engages with it, everyone I've met through the comments, all the things I've learned and been enriched by in the conversations that I have from day to day on the Paul Wallace channel. If you haven't jumped into the comments and seen some of those conversations, that's a great way to spend some time. There are new videos and audio onlys coming up very, very soon. And in the next one, I'll have to find some artful place to put this in the background. Thanks once again, stay engaged, keep watching, and I'll look out for you in the comments.